Guys, t- today, obviously, a lot of us know a day like today being uh, Halloween is the beginning of the cluster of holidays, right, that close out a year, right? You got Halloween before you know it, it's Thanksgiving before you know it, it's Christmas before you know it, it's the New Year. And so some of you, some of uh, especially our church fam, I've been talking to you guys, letting you know that we are starting something today. We are already in. My mind, my focus is already in 2022, all right? I'm not waiting for the new year to start No, we are going to end this year strong. We're going to end this year in our pursuit of God well. So when 2022 shows up, we're already all warmed up, all right? So that's me. I don't know if you guys are with me online. You with me today? Let me know. Everybody here, you with me today? Are you going to wait till New Year's to, you know, to commit to do something that you know you're not going to do past January 21st? But anyways, that's why we're starting now. All right, that's why we're starting now. Guys, we have a new series with a new focus already looking into the new year. And you saw it a minute ago on that title screen that says, what is in it for me? And we are focusing on what we really just were singing about. We were just talking about the presence of God, enjoying, interacting with, approaching the presence of God. And there's so many ways that we are called to do this. It's called spiritual disciplines. All right, we do this by the way we interact with one another, not just on Sundays, but every day. And reading the Bible and and giving and uh, praying. And there's so many things that go with it. But a lot of people and a lot of times people look at those things and they ask the question, well, what's in it for me? Why should I do these things? And and that actually shows uh, something that needs to be addressed, all right, when we ask that question or when we don't do. And so when it comes to this, guys, listen, we've been discussing over the last couple of months, how do we mature in our faith? And the reason why we need to mature is because we need to grow up. I know a lot of us, right, we, a lot of us, uh, we've done you know, we've stopped growing physically, you know, right, height-wise. Some of y'all stopped growing in middle school, right? Some of y'all still got a little bit more to go, right? Some of y'all still got to grow some more. But uh, let's be real. The second you stopped growing this way, well, and let's be real, sometimes some, some of us have grown this way sometimes. You know, that, that happens, right? That's life. We grow instead of vertically, we grow, you know, horizontally, but, um, right, that way. But listen, as a person, do we ever stop growing? Or should we stop growing? No. As people, we should constantly be maturing. Same thing goes with our spirit. And guys, I want you to know that as Christians, we are constantly, and God calls us to mature and go from co-consumers to co-workers. We need to go from consumers of God's presence and consumers of the gospel to co-workers of the gospel. And I'm going to read a little list of what uh, that looks like. I got this from uh, Robbie uh, Gallaty, I believe that's how you say it. And there's a couple that I added. And this is important, guys, because listen, if you were a believer in Christ, even if it was two seconds ago, we all start as consumers. That is our natural state as people, to look and to get and to always focus on me. That is our natural state. That's what sin is. Sin, the natural default sin of the flesh, always just wants to get, 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 never give, or only gives with the focus of getting, right? And so, as Christians, we need to mature past that. We cannot be consumers and stay consumers because God calls each and every one of us, regardless of your title, regardless of your education level, we, God calls all of us to be co-workers. And let me give you a list of what that looks like. This is how we need to grow. Consumers are spectators, all right? These are c- Christians who are just spectators. All they do is sit in the stands and watch. While co-workers are to be participants. They get in the game. That's what a co-worker is. A consumer, okay, Oh, man, this one's not going to land right. Consumers show up late to services or don't show up as often. Co-workers show up regularly and early in order to help. Yikes. All right, here we go. I'm going to keep going before somebody else starts throwing stuff at me. Ready? Consumers criticize what other people are doing inside of the church. That's what consumers do. They constantly have an opinion of what everybody else should be doing and what they're not doing. Co-workers can appreciate what God is doing despite any imperfection that still may remain. Y'all feel me on that one? Consumers take for themselves, are constantly just, they go and they participate and they do all these things. They go to conferences, Bible studies, worship nights, church services. They do all these things just so they can get and leave nice and full. That's consumers, consumer Christians. While co-workers not get in order to give. Consumers, I'm sorry, co-workers are constantly looking at how can I pour into somebody else? That's a co-worker. And I'm going to add a couple more here. These are mine. A consumer is constantly tearing things down. A co-worker is working to build things. Consumers tear things down. A co-worker looks to build things up. 
A consumer is always asking the question, what is in it for me? What does the church have to offer me? What, is you, what do you have to offer me? That's what a consumer focuses on. What is in it for me? While a coworker asks, what has God done for me? And what can I do in response to that? What can I do? That is a coworker. Now, if some of you feel attacked over these last little 30, 45 seconds, good, all right, because I am too. All right, we're all in the same boat, all right? Because the reason why, guys, if you feel like, oh, he's addressing me. Yes, I am. I'm addressing me too. Because, guys, I have the tendency as well. Yeah, I know I'm the pastor, but I have the tendency as well to float from coworker to consumer. I have that tendency as well. We all do. And if we are not purposeful about maturing and growing in co-workers and becoming co-workers, you will automatically drift in becoming a consumer. If you're not purposeful in being a co-worker, you will drift in being a consumer. And you miss out on so much that God has wants to do and show you. And so today we're going to look at and we're going to learn from Jesus's little brother on how to move from being consumers to co-workers. And yes, some of y'all, that sounds weird. I did not misspeak. Jesus had brothers and sisters. We see that in the Gospels. They talk about that. We know of two of his siblings. All right. After Jesus was the firstborn, after Jesus, Mary and Joseph had babies and Jesus had brothers and sisters. None of them believed he was the Messiah while they were while Jesus was out there doing his thing. All right, they literally thought, bro, big brother, what you doing, man? Um, you, bro, you're making a family look bad, dude. What, who, what happened? What got into Jesus? What got into Jesus, man? And so, and that's a lot of pressure. Some of y'all have siblings and their sibling rivalries. Who wants the son of God to be your sibling rivalry already, right? That already, this is the pressure that Jane, that some of these guys had having Jesus as their little, as their older brother, man. But anyways, Jesus had two brothers that we know of. One his name is James, the other, Jude. Now, I don't know if Mary and Joseph, what they had with the J names. I don't know, me and Alicia got the same thing, right? We got three boys, three Js. You, know, you got Joshua, Josiah, Jeremiah, Mary and Joseph had Jesus, James, and Jude, all with Js. So I, don't, I don't know what the deal is. Uh, the Js aren't more sanctified than anything else, just in case some of y'all got a J name. But James and Jude were some of Jesus's little brothers. And here's what's amazing. Both of them have letters that they written that are actually in our New Testament, James and Jude became believers in Jesus, not while he was alive. They saw their big brother die, and they thought he died a failure, a lunatic, a crackhead, whatever, bro. He's gone, bro. What is Jesus? Why did Jesus, what happened to James and Jude that made him believe that Jesus was more than their big brother, but the Savior, Messiah, and God himself? Because they saw their big brother die, and a weekend later, they saw him alive again. I'm telling you, if you had a relative pass away and a week later that relative shows up, you're not going to be the same person, okay? You might be, you know, you maybe think you're going nuts, right? I mean, that might jack you up mentally, but I'm telling you, if you saw a, and you saw a, a, a person you loved, and you know they're died, embalmed and buried and all that stuff, and later he's alive and it's not a figment of your imagination, you're never going to be the same person again. James and Jude were the same. Jude actually became a missionary, not only a believer of Jesus, but Jude now be hyping his big brother up and he became a missionary telling others, spreading the gospel and letting others know, listen, I came to faith in Christ after I, I missed it. I didn't know. I took him for granted. I wasn't. I assumed things. How many of us assume things of God already and you're missing out because you made a faulty assumption? James did. And James was so grateful that he was able to have his eyes open. And that's my prayer constantly for us, guys, that we can constantly just you know, open our eyes more and more and get to see who Jesus is. And that's what Jude does in this letter, which we're going to read. Uh, the book of Jude, it's just really one letter. There's no chapters. It is 25 verses long. Uh, you can read it in five minutes or less. Even if you're a slow reader, you can read it. So it's uh, right before the book of Revelation. It's at the back end. We're going to look at this verse. And here we're going to start with his opening. Look, look what he already says at the very beginning. At the very beginning, Jude opens up his letter talking about, look, servant of Christ Jesus, I'm the brother of James. And so he starts in verse 3. We're going to put it online. If you, uh, you have your notes already, you can go online to our website, tabernacleofgod.church. There's a note section there. All the verses are there. So reading Jude 3, it says, dear friends, he's writing to believers in, in Christ. Although I was eager to write to you about the salvation that we share. Like, look, man, I wanted to talk to, I wanted to break down the salvation that we have in Christ. But... I found it necessary to write, appealing to you to contend for the faith, to fight for the faith that we, that was delivered to us 
and to the saints once and for all. For some people who were designated for this judgment long ago have come by stealth. They are ungodly, turning the grace of our God into sensuality and denying Jesus Christ, our only master and Lord. Now, I think it's interesting. We're reading a verse like today on a day like today because I know for some of y'all, you know, the the hype is Halloween. But today in the Christian holiday, it is also a different one. Today is Reformation Day. It is the anniversary of when Martin Luther, he was a a theologian back in the day, over 500 years ago. He nailed the, his thesis is 95 different uh, theses on the church, on the door of a church. He just went ahead and just did that. He, that this was, you know. You can't make a social media post, but this was his, his equivalent. He made this thing, posted it on the doors of the church so all can see, because he was addressing a problem that was happening in the church back then, which, which by the way, still happens today, and it was the problem that Jude was having, is that there was too much confusion. There was a lot of people out there making God look bad, confusing everybody from what salvation was, what does it look like? And so he went after that Catholic church, which was not acting like a church at all. That was acting more like an empire who, you know, they would crown kings and this. And it was all about power. It was not about the power of God. It was all about the power of man. And this church had controlled and, cons- and lied and deceived people, making them think and dependent on people to for salvation instead of being dependent on God. And Martin Luther had enough. And he made that post out there and it went viral. And history has never been the same again. Revival happened because of that. And we call it the great reformation because the society was reformed. The world was reformed. And, it be, and the reason why it was reformed was because people were reformed by the truth of God when they came to realize what is actually in here and who Jesus is. Guys, that's, I just said that a minute ago and we were singing, in your presence we are undone. That's what happens, guys, when we draw near to the truth of God. We are constantly formed and reformed by the truth. And so Paul, or no, not Paul, but Jude, he's doing the same thing. Well, Martin Luther did the same thing he's doing. He's saying, guys, we got to address some issues. We got to address some issues. And he called out these people. In the whole letter, you can read it. He calls them dreamers and deceivers. So he calls some of them dreamers because these are people who are twisting the scriptures and they're saying, oh, they got a dream from God. God has given me this dream and and it's this special revelation. God spoke to me directly, word for word, verbatim. All right, that's going to be for another day, but... And he said these things and these things, and, and they were twisting scriptures. That's why he says, there's people who coming out here and saying, guys, Jesus had saved us from all of our sins. Guess what that means? We are free from sin, and guess what that means? We can be free to sin. Let's just have fun. Jesus has given us the ultimate get out of jail free card. Let's live it up without fear or worry, and let's just have fun because Jesus, man, he's, it's on him. He's paying the tab. Yikes. That's what he says to sensuality. People were, they were literally twisting and saying, you can live however you want, whatever feels good, do it. And, and it was corrupting people, it wasn't helping, and Jude had to address that. Some of these people were receiving dreams from the Holy Spirit, and it wasn't the Spirit, it were demonic spirits, not the Holy Spirit. And he called them deceivers, because they were lying and they were pushing all of these things. Notice that they came by stealth, I love the word he used, stealth, under the radar. Everything that they were saying on the surface level, looked good, felt good, sounded right, but it wasn't. These guys came in through stealth, turning the grace of our God into sensuality. And here's the key. They denied Jesus as our only master and Lord. Guys, that word, he, he, he kind of breaks this off. He goes off on them for the whole letter. Verses 5 through 19, he's just going off on these guys, helping the church identify people. And he calls them apostates, all right? So that's a fancy word, y'all. Apostate is apostasy. Literally means somebody who is rejecting the faith. Somebody who claims to be a believer in Jesus, but they don't live it. That's what apostasy is or an apostate. And that's what he's claiming. He said, these guys, bro, they got the jersey, but they're not on the team. All right. They got the, we got some snakes in the grass. All right. That's what it is. We got to be careful with them. And so he highlights that, focuses on that. And then he actually, in the, in the end, he talks about this, how we received this from Jesus and the apostles that in the end, in the last days, There will be scoffers, mockers, living according to their own godly desire. These people created for division are worldly. They don't have the Holy Spirit inside of them. Do you know how often Jesus and the apostles, we see, you know, James and Jude, and and they were talking about the other 12 apostles, Peter, Paul, everybody else, John, Matthew, Mark, all these guys, 
that was a constant theme of Jesus. It's amazing when you look back, I was like, how much Jesus constantly reminded his own people, be careful. Because see, I'm here to testify to the truth. And the enemy, the devil, everything that Jesus is going to do, he's going to try to counterfeit it. And it's not going to be, see, the devil's not going to go completely. We talked about this even last year. He's not going to totally go, well, Jesus says this, and the, and the devil's going to give you the complete opposite. No, if Jesus says this, the devil's going to give you something that's like right there. It's not, Jesus says what is right. The devil says things that are almost right. It's almost right. But almost right, isn't it still wrong? Right? Almost right is still wrong. But that's what the enemy does. It's almost right. Because he doesn't want you to know and believe and to follow through. He wants you almost there. Not there. He says, these guys don't have the Holy Spirit. You guys got to be careful with these things. But what I love about Jude is that he puts this emphasis on them, calling them waterless clouds. I love that analogy. He calls them fruitless trees. They look good on the outside, but on the inside, there's nothing. And that's what we got to look for. That's what we need to look for. But then, like, uh, I mean, led by even the, the Holy Spirit himself, he doesn't put the focus outward, but he also puts the focus inward. He says, guys, not only do you need to pay attention to what's happening, that's the purpose of this letter. The purpose is to address the issues that are on the outside. But because there's pressure on the outside, he then goes off and talks about these principles. And so we're going to look at, that's the purpose of the letter. Let's look at the principles in the letter. Verse 20 through 23. Now he goes internally and the focus goes on the believer. Because we got some people out there stealth, because we got some people out there doing damage, guys, you have a part to play. Everybody, not me for you. Guys, I'm here relaying the play because everybody has a part to play. And so here's what he says. Let's look at verse, tw uh, verse 20, just the first half. But you, so already showing a difference, but you, compared to those other guys, you're different. You don't be like that, but you, as you build yourselves up in the most holy faith. I just want to stop there. As you build yourselves up in the most holy faith. Uh, look at that phrase. Build yourself up. Build yourselves up. Now, that's a, a lot of times that, that verse gets misquoted a lot. Uh, build yourselves up in the most holy faith. Guys, you and I, what makes this faith that we have holy, wonderful, like we were describing, is the fact that that is all that it takes to be saved. I want you all to process that. It is only, salvation is only by faith, through the grace of God. That is all we are called to do, to be saved. But guys, that's not it. That's not it. A lot of times, some people, a lot of Christians, they look at their conversion. Maybe it was a day that you walked up to the front of some church. Maybe it was a day that you raised your hand. Somebody prayed with you. You had a real encounter with God, and you said, I, maybe it was a youth camp or something like that. I choose. I believe in Jesus. And you know you're saved. Guys, you, but so many people treat that as the finish line. The finish line. But no, it's not. Guys, that is not the finish line. That is the starting line. You are just getting started. So many people say, well, I'm saved, I'm good, so I can just kind of do what I want and kind of float and coast until, no, no. He says, build yourself on, build yourselves up from that faith, on that faith. Guys, it's so many times, even in Christian circles, I'm here to tell you as well, there's this kind of vibe where it's like, look, you graduate from the gospel. Like the gospel, Jesus died on the cross for you, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. We've all heard that, some of y'all heard that a thousand times. And there's a lot of people out there, a lot of Christians, some uh, big name speakers and big name book writers and all these people, they talk in a way that, okay, that's cute, that's, but God has other things for us. Like we graduate from the simple things to more glorious and supernatural things. No, we never graduate, we never move from that basic foundation of the cross. That's not it, no, we build on that. I mean, honestly, the more you mature in Christ, the more John 3, 16 just gets bigger and bigger and the deeper you dive in it and the more wonderful those words become. That is what maturing in Christ looks like. We don't just go past the things of salvation and now we move on to greater and mightier and you know more amazing things in the spirit. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. You can't do the other one apart from this one. They both go together. We don't graduate from it. No, we constantly build on it. So notice it says, build yourselves up. Oh, and I love the plural. This isn't something that you do. Paul habitually talked about. How are we as Christians to mature? You know how you're not supposed to? Alone. You don't do it alone. 
You can't just get yourself in a room and get yourself and just you and God and the Bible and you don't need anybody else and you're going to grow spiritually. I smell a lie. Nope. All right. Can't do it that way. We weren't meant to. Every time it says, Paul says that we are built up. You are supposed to build somebody else up. Again, consumers focus on me. I'm going to go and I, got, I don't need anyone for my personal relation with God. Okay, true. Yes. But come on now. All right. There, it's, it's a little different. They go too far. And consumers is always focused on me. I want, who's going to pour into me and and me, me, me. But no, a mature Christian is, no, I need to pour. I get built up by building you up. I get encouraged by encouraging you. That's how you grow. And some of you guys have been stagnant probably because I know I have. When I look back and I realize I stopped growing, it's because I stopped pouring into somebody's life. That's that's just it. And there's another one too, but. That's, a, that's an important one. If you are not pouring into, God's not going to pour into you if, you, if it's not going to go anywhere. It's, it's not a cup, you know, you, it needs to be a river that flows. And so this is an important one, guys, as a church to build yourselves up. You do this together. You get built up by somebody else as you're building them up and they're building you up and you're building, that's how it works together. You build yourselves up on this faith. And, and already right there, he talks about faith is more than just believing. We kind of simplify faith and saying, I believe. Faith is, I believe. Oh, uh, Yes. But see, true faith, your true belief is going to impact your behavior. Paul talks about this a lot. Sincere faith is going to follow, it's going to follow something is going to happen. James talks about this. Don't just be a hearer of the word, but a doer. Guys, that's the theme. Jesus said it as well, that you don't obey because you don't love me. If you'd love me, you'd obey. So you see, the faith actually has, is connected to faithfulness. And so that's what James is trying to say. Listen, if you got faith in Jesus, great. Your faith is reflected in your faithfulness, how you follow through. Notice these other guys claim to have faith, but they don't because they're not following through. They're denying Christ. They're denying salvation like that, (coughs) believing that you can do whatever you want. They're not following through. Faith is equivalent to following through. Now, look at this next, the rest of that verse. Can we put the, the whole verse up? It says, build yourselves up on the most holy faith. And then he goes and gives examples of how you build yourselves up. He starts by saying what? Praying in the Holy Spirit. Guys, I don't got time for this today. I'll leave it for another day. But I'm telling you now, if your definition of praying in the Spirit is only speaking in tongues, you have a very small view of what that is. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to here to argue to say, okay, that's going to be for a different day. But if your only definition, if what, and, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, you don't need to worry about that debate right now, okay? But only the people that are, all right? Stop right there. If for you, praying in tongues is only defined, I'm sorry, praying in the spirit is only defined as praying in a tongue that you don't know, that only you and God knows, you have a very small view of that. If, I'm, if, if what I'm about to say, all right, what I'm about to say is foundational and biblical, if you can't add what I, that definition to what I'm about to do, well, we'll talk about that later, right? I'd love to talk to you about it. But what does it mean to pray in the Holy Spirit? That's the big one. Praying in the spirit. Well, guys, we see, Paul talks about this a lot. I don't got time for it. In Romans 6 and 8, he talks about this. In 1 Corinthians, he talks about this. And it's always consistent with the same thing. To pray in the Spirit, and Paul talks about walking in the Spirit. So here's how I know. Like, it's not just about saying a language and words that you don't understand what you're saying. Because when you walk in the Spirit, are you doing things and you don't know what you're doing? No, there's an understanding there. They both go together. And so to pray in the Spirit is to walk in the Spirit. It's the same principle. It's to be in sync with the mind and will of the Spirit. So when we walk according to the Spirit, it's because we are walking, doing, living according to the will of the Spirit in the mind of the Spirit. Same thing when we pray. That means that when you pray, you, we ought to pray what's the will of God and the mind of God. And you guys know how we find that out? Right here. And this is how I know. But when you pray in the spirit, look, all right, let me give you a math problem, okay? I'm oh, like, wait, what? Yes. All right, uh, algebra. If A, I know, hang with me, Ricky. You got this, watch. If A equals B and B equals C, then A also equals C. You follow me on that? If A equals B and B equals C, then A is also C. All right? Same thing. We constantly see the Holy Spirit. Now, I got you. Here we go. The Holy Spirit, we see Paul talks about this. This, It is the spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. The armor of God that we get. It's the belt. It's the, you know, what's the the belt, bro? The the belt of truth and the, the, you know, the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, shield of the, shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, 
which is the truth of God. Sword of the Spirit, which is the truth. It's all the same thing. The truth of God is our armor. This is what it is. It's an armor of light. It's an armor of truth. And so the, to pray in the Spirit is to pray according to God's Word. It's praying according to that. And we know what the will of the Holy Spirit is. Paul talks about in Romans that, do you know that the Holy Spirit is praying for you right now? Do you know that? This is an amazing ministry that he has. That Jesus is before the Father praying for us, interceding for us. And at the same time, every believer in Christ has the Holy Spirit indwelling in you, praying for you 24-7. See, the Holy Spirit knows God's will for your life. And he's praying for you. He's praying for you in ways that you don't understand. And that's why Paul says in Romans, listen, when you don't know, sometimes we don't know what to pray about. Anybody ever been there? You've been asked to pray. You're like, uh, 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 you feel like a horrible failure. Jesus, I'm letting you down. Uh, this is embarrassing. I'm embarrassing you. I'm embarrassing myself, right? In the prayers, because you don't know what to pray for sometimes. This is awesome because they say, when you don't know what to pray for, Remember that, you look, you have the Holy Spirit that knows you. He knows what to pray for. So when you don't know what to pray, ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, what should I pray? Because he is praying for you right now. Can you learn to listen and be in sync with what he is doing? You see what that is? So to pray in the Spirit is to pray in the mind of the Spirit, the will of the Spirit. Do you know what the Holy Spirit wants for you? Do you know what he is praying for you right now? The Holy Spirit is praying for you right now for you to continually know Christ. He is praying for you right now that the fruit of the Spirit will be evident in your life. He is praying for you right now that the gifts will be evident in your life right now. He is praying for you right now that you can walk in the truth, that you will mature and grow in holiness. That is what he's praying for. So if you don't know what to pray for, default to that. I'm like, God, I help me to know you. Help me to reflect you. Help me to walk. Help me to grow. That is what it means to pray in the Spirit. It doesn't mean to pray in this random nonsense. Or, no, that's what it is. No, it is to pray accurately. All right, that's what it is. So again, if you, if you have that other one, build it on top of this. If not, you have a very small view of that. I might even say incorrect, but I'm going to stop there. Guys, praying in the Spirit is also not praying in your own understanding and wisdom. It is resting and relying on God. The same way that we can't live without the Holy Spirit, guys, we can't pray without the Spirit. We need Him for all things. And so here, notice the first one he says, right? How do you build yourselves up? Praying in the Spirit, praying according to the Word of God. Uh, if you don't open this and read this, you won't know what the will and mind and heart of God is. That's why you need to do this. This is why we're talking about that. We're gonna go deeper into this over the next month, two months. All right, look at the next one he says. By the way, it's always, it's always said there. I've always heard, how do you build yourself up? Praying in the Spirit. And there's a comma, there's no period there, there's more, so let's keep on going. Uh, verse 21, pray, we, how do you build yourselves up? By praying in the Spirit, by getting in sync to God's Word. Look what he says in 21. He says, keep yourselves in the most, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. This is how you also build yourselves up. Notice when he says, keeping into the love of God, you know what he, that means? It doesn't mean stay in love with God. It's not just talking about emotions. Jesus talked about this. He says, if you'd love me, you'd obey. And he would say this words on saying, by the way, that sounds so manipulative. It's not. That is not a manipulative statement. Uh, if you love me, you do it. You know, that's not Jesus. Jesus is saying, listen, you don't do certain things. Do you know why? It's because you don't love me. That's why. That's it. This is being real. You, you, you act a certain way because you don't care. If you cared, you'd be different. You, you feel me? That's what he's saying. And Jesus himself said, how do you keep in the love of God. Well, Jesus used the same word, but he used a different word to abide in the love of God. And Jesus gave the definition again, A equals B, B equals C, A equals C, right? Anyways, here's what it means. Jesus says, if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And to abide in me is to abide in my word. And if you abide in my word, then apart from me, you, apart from the word of God, you can do nothing. And you know, he also said another one, his love. If you abide in my love, you can do nothing. Guys, the truth of God is the love of God. This is love on paper. This is love. This is love. The truth is the love of God because it is God. God is love. And if God is love and God is truth, it's the same thing. So to keep is not just saying we pray in the spirit, but to keep in love is to apply the things that we're learning about, is to live it out in our lives. And we do it with this future perspective. Did you guys catch it? Waiting eagerly for Jesus Christ. To come. It's not just an earthly perspective, it's an eternal one. We know that we are not living for this world, we're living for a better one that is and yet to come. 
That is our perspective. Like I said last week, we want to make sure when Jesus shows up, he catches us busy doing the right thing, or at least in the attempt, right? And that's, that's in that direction, moving forward, right? That is what he says. That is what we're called to do, to pray in this way. And, oh, I got to stop because here's, already, here's where the snakes and the grass come in stealth, ready? And it sounds religious. Sounds right. I'll tell you things. What, to keep in love is to obey. It's to grow in holiness. And you to grow in holiness means to stop thinking and doing and going and interacting with certain people in certain ways. And already there's Christians who will already, already stop and confront me and say, ah, that's legalism. That's rule following. There's people that, that call when we say we need to live holy, holier. They'll call that legalism. Listen, some people's attempt, yes, they only want to do the right thing, not because they want to, it's because they want others to admire them. Look how beautiful, look how wonderful you are. You're so good, I wanna be just like you. There's some people that are religious like that because they want the praise. They don't live because of praising God. No, they want the praise from people. But listen, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with following rules because of out of love. Listen, there are people I don't interact with in my social media feed. There are accounts I don't follow um, because I love my wife, all right? Not because if she catch, first off, she has my password. So she, uh, she has my password, she accesses, she loves just scrolling through my stuff just for fun. And it's freeing to know that I'm just looking through my man's stuff and I know I ain't gonna find anything. It's pretty nice. And knowing that I'm not like sweating, like, oh my God, I hope she don't find one. You know, I, I'm never panicked when she has my phone. And I don't have a burner account, that's it, it's the only one, all right? But listen, there are certain things I don't do. Why? Because I value this relationship. I don't want to wreck it. Guys, there, if you value a relationship with God, there's going to be certain things you're not going to want to do. Not because you want to be legalistic. It's because you love. It's not out of a sense of legalism. It's out of a sense of loyalty. That's okay. But it's needed to, guys. We need to keep growing in the love of God, applying, living, learning to love the things that God loves, hate the things that God we, um, love. We were just talking about this a couple days ago. We started watching something that I watched a long time ago when I was a, when I was young and I was a kid, and back then, oh, it was funny. I mean, gut busting, and we're watching it again, and I'm disgusted. How did I think this is funny? How did I think anybody? How, did, has, how, is, how is this considered comedy? You know, because it, it's that's what it does when the love of God. You do things out of loyalty, out of love, because of Him. So He says, "Here's how you build yourselves up, guys. We pray in the Spirit, get in God's Word." talking to him. He's talking to you. We're living it out, keeping into the love of God, waiting for Christ to return. And then in verse 22, look what he says here. Have mercy. All right, for all my Full House fans, have mercy. All right. Um, here he says, have mercy, but in a different way. Not like Uncle Jesse. We're going to talk to Uncle Jude. All right. That's the one we're talking about. That's the one who says, have mercy. He says, have mercy on those. Have mercy on those who waver. Saving others. Um, okay, stop. Have mercy on those who waver. One group. Then, save others by snatching them from the fire. And then he repeats, have mercy on others, but with fear, hating even the garments defiled by the flesh. All right, so what does he mean, have mercy? See, here's how we grow in the faith. How do we mature in the faith? When we're learning to in sync with the word of God, praying in the spirit, walking in the spirit. I can, you can easily say, keep in love, is to walk in the spirit. We pray in the spirit. We walk in the spirit with our understanding and with what we don't know, we trusting in God. But part of that also looks like how we interact with others. He says, have mercy on those who waver. He's talking about Christians there, believers. So if you've got a believer who's deceived, a believer who's inconsistent, a believer who's hard-headed, a believer who, grow, who was growing and stopped growing and now they're going backwards, have mercy on those people. Love them, encourage them, be kind to them. Help them to see and turn back. Don't condemn them and ah, this and that unless they're being problematic. I'll tell you right now, problematic people, yeah, look, we love you. We're still going to be kind to you, but yo, psst, watch this person. I'm telling y'all now, all right? Everybody watch this person, all right? There's a wolf with sheep's clothing right here, right? We love you. We're going to pray for you, but uh, this person sus, all right, right there. But it says, pray for those who waver, who aren't sure yet. Be patient with them. Be patient if you've been saying the same thing to them and they still don't get it. It's okay. Have mercy on them. Be kind in the way that somebody was with you because you weren't the smartest, you know, sharpest knife in the box and all that other stuff. No, somebody was merciful and kind to you. And then he says, with others, snatch them from the fire. These are unbelievers. We should have mercy. Our hearts should break for the people that we know that don't know God because they are about to face 
judgment fire, talking about eternal perspective, that's an eternal perspective. We need to be helping those who are wavering, bringing, restoring our you know, brothers and sisters who get caught in sin, and those who are still enslaved to sin, have mercy on them, telling them about the love of God, reflecting the love of God, so that we may snatch them from the fire. And he, no, it was kind of weird, and it says, hate even the clothing. Like, he's just saying, and be careful, by the way. Because if you're trying to interact with people who are in sin or caught in sin, don't get sucked up. That's what he's saying. It's like, be careful. Don't think yourself too proud that, oh, I'm not going to do that. I can go there and be okay. I can be fine and in that environment. And oh, what happened? All right, before you know it. So he says, do that, but be careful. Don't get sucked up into what's got them. Because look, it can be under the radar. Stealth. That's what he was saying. So be careful. And so guys, look, I'm going to, oh, before I read the last 24 and 25, let me remix what he just said. How do you build yourself up in the faith? How do you grow from here when you are saved, when you, when you become saved? What do you do? Those three things, we, you grow, you, you pray in the spirit, you walk in the spirit, and you reflect the spirit. You reflect the truth in all things. Let me rephrase that a different way. Talk. How do you build yourself up in the faith? You let God talk to you. Got it? You let God talk to you through his word. Guys, I'm telling you right now, warning, if all you want is, I just want the, if all you care about is receiving special, unique revelations from God and you can care less about what he said here, problem. I'm gonna say that one again. If, if this is boring to you and all you care about is what is something new, I want God, if you build your life based on what only you are hearing from God from right here and that is your only default, no, that's bad news. You build, everything that he says is not going to go against everything that's been written. Okay? This is God's word. This is his voice. You want to hear his voice, just crack open the Bible, read out loud. Okay? If you want to hear it verbally, read the Bible out loud. That's God's voice. You won't know that voice unless you know this one well, because this is his voice. So be careful. So how do you grow up in your faith, guys? You let God talk to you. You talk to God and talk to others about God. All three. You need all three. If you don't have one of those out of, out of whack, oh, and when you talk to others about God, you talk to other Christians about God, and you talk to non-believers. If you are missing one of those elements, guys, you're not going to grow as much. It's like you're trying to be healthy. You, you need three things in order to be healthy. Do you know this? You need food, it's diet, exercise, and rest. Let's say you rest seven, eight hours a day, and you work out like a fiend, but you eat whatever you want. It's not going to work. Let's say your diet is impeccable and your workouts are amazing, yet you only sleep three to four hours. Your body will never, will never recover. You're going to break down. You will not be healthy. Even though you're eating well and working out well, but if you're not resting, no, it's not going to be good. And then vice versa. You rest well. You, you know, what was the other? You rest well and you have a beautiful diet, yet you do nothing. You live a sedentary life and you're just constantly sitting down. The only exercise you get is this, right? Or... No, that's the only exercise you get is your finger or your front. I mean, that's it. It's not going to work. Guys, the same thing. If you want to mature in your faith, you need all those elements. Is God talking to you? Are you talking to God regularly? Are you talking to believers about God? And are you talking to others who are not about God? All of those things go together. And look how he finishes it, which, by the way, we read this verse during worship today. I thought it was fitting. Can we put verse 24 and 25 up? Look how Jude ends this message. He says, guys, there's some people out there. We got to watch out for them. And because so, let's build ourselves up. Let's be on guard. And then he says, and now to him, Jesus, we read this earlier, who is able to protect you from stumbling, not from sinning, but from stumbling into deception, from stumbling into fear, from stumbling into the lie, into traps of the enemy. He is able to keep protect you from stumbling. The truth keeps you from stumbling into lies. Y'all follow me? The truth protects you from that. Make, and he says, and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy to the only. Notice he says only, because the other people are saying, yeah, Jesus is just one of. No, Judas like, guys, nah. Only God, our Savior, through my big brother, Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, authority, before all time, now and forever, amen. Drop the mic, all right? That's Jude talking about his brother and savior. He talks about the purpose. So we look, the purpose of the letter. There's out there people twisting the truth. So what's the principles he talks about? We gotta build ourselves up. We gotta be on guard. And what's the promise? He ends with a promise. 
that if we build ourselves up and we, if we keep to God, guys, look at this. If we keep to God, God keeps us. If we keep to God, God will keep us. Now, he keeps us. We're saved, but he will keep us from all these things if we do. So, guys, I'm going to challenge you as we're going to end today. And as we're going to go into this next uh, last two months of the year, let's, I want to challenge you. So w- which one of those elements are you missing? Let's build ourselves up. The reason why, guys, because there's people out there who are tearing things down. And there's an enemy out there who wants to tear you away from your God. There is an enemy that wants to tear you and keep you away from God. And we got to build ourselves up, protecting, encouraging, loving one another. So I'm going to challenge you guys. If you've been inconsistent with your maturity, it starts here with the word of God. If you've been inconsistent, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to challenge you for the next five days. Can you do those three things for the next five days? Shoot for 30 minutes a day. I'm, I, I Just do it. 30 minutes a day for the next five days. Let God talk to you. Talk to God. And then when it's all said and done, talk to somebody else about what you heard. Either a believer or a non-believer. Can I challenge you to do that for 30 minutes? 30 minutes for the next five days. Be consistent with that. Keep showing up. Do that. Now, what if at the end of the 30 minutes or at the end of the week, well, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I didn't get anything out of it. You know, my kids tell me this sometimes. They're trying to, you know, memorize Bible verses and do different stuff. I was like, all right, so what you, what does it mean? I don't, I don't know. All right. I, like, I don't know. But, but here's the thing, guys. It's, yes, it's important for us to remember things, but it's not about information accumulation. It's about a personal transformation. So here's, let me ask you a question. Do you guys remember, I uh, love uh, Robbie Gallaty had this, this analogy. Do you guys remember everything you've eaten this last week? Stop and think, online. Do you remember everything you've eaten this last week? Can you even remember what you ate yesterday? Right? Maybe, maybe not. But do you remember what you've eaten last week? No. But it shows that you've eaten though, right? Some of us, it shows a little more than others, right? Me too. It shows a little more than others. You don't remember everything you've eaten, but it shows, and you know you ate though, right? You know you ate, but you don't remember, and because you've eaten, you are so much better for it. Guys, let me just encourage you. You get into God's word, and you pray, and you read his word, you might walk out of there sometimes, well, I don't know, I didn't get anything from today. Okay, but did you spend time with God? Yeah. Good. It'll show. It'll show. It, it, even at the end of the week, pastor, I, I did it. 30 minutes, I read all these verses and stuff. I don't remember anything, but I did it. Good. It's part of it, guys. Keep showing up. Let God talk. This is a daily thing, and so for some of us, it needs to be ongoing. Let it be a daily thing, because the more we show up, God will show himself to you. And the more he shows himself to you, it's going to show in the way you think, in the way you act, in the way you live. And if it's not, it's because, I'll tell you right now, every time there's been a, a slowdown in my life spiritually, it's because I stopped showing up. I still read my Bible, but I wasn't checked in. Oh, kind of a little quick prayer, a little quick Bible verse. Yeah, guys, I still get tempted to do that too. I start to realize I start to go dry when I just, I'm not present. I'm not engaged in the moment. And there's amazing times I've had with God. And if you tell me, at the, it was, hey, what'd you read about today? Ah, oh, man, I, I don't know. I, I don't remember it, but I know I spent time with him and it made a difference in my life. It's okay. It's not about learning it all and being the smartest person. It's about getting into his presence, into his word into his truth. The more you keep showing up, the more you keep gathering, the more you keep encouraging, the more you keep connecting, the more you keep praying and worshiping and reading and reflecting and meditating, the more you do, the more he will keep you. And you will see, it'll show, the results will show. But that's something he can't force you to do, guys. He's just waiting for us to show up. Sometimes we're waiting for God to show up, but what if God's just waiting for you to show up first and then he will? That's an important one. And so I'll I'll give you Martin Luther we're talking about today. Martin Luther and being Reformation Day, he once said this truth. Every man should live for the glory of God. But the question is, he says this, he makes a statement. Everybody should live for the glory of God. Whether others do or not, doesn't matter. I will. That is the kind of commitment. Listen, you can't control everybody else. You can't control everybody else. I'm telling you, guys, enjoy. Live for the glory of God. Spend time with him. And regardless if others do it or not, can you commit today? Say, no, I will. I will show up. Believing that God will show himself. It's an important one. All right, remember, it's not about asking, well, what's in it for me? No, I'm gonna ask you instead, can you reflect on just what has God done for you? That's why. Reflect on what God has done for you. Some of you have shown up today, online and in person. 
Some of you showed up wondering, wondering, asking yourself if God was real and maybe you were doubting. And I'm here to tell you he was. And the fact that you showed up, the fact that you showed up, I know he's showing himself to you and saying, listen, I've loved you this whole time. Despite that maybe you were ignorant of certain things or confused about certain things, but I still love you. I do. I have not lost you. I have not forgotten you. I've always been there. And for the rest of us, if you're a believer in Christ Jesus and you're finding it hard to make time for God, listen, you and I, let me say a heavy word. We make time for the things that we want. We always make time for the things that we want. And if you realize I'm not spending the kind of time that I want to spend with God because I don't want to, let that bother you and let that be your prayer because the Spirit's desire is for you to want to. So God, I repent. I have an issue. Help me because I don't want to. Help me sincerely. Guys, he'll show, he'll continue to show off if we continue to show up. And we don't do any of these things. We don't go to church and read and encourage just so we can get something out of it. We do it because we get to, because of what Jesus did for us. We get to spend time with him. We get to hear his voice. We get to have and experience the love of God because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Don't let that, don't let that sit on the table, guys. I want you to take it. I'm gonna give you a quick reflection and we're out of here. Let's pray. Bow your heads, please. Lord, God, right now I pray for each and every one of us. Today was a word that requires immediate action. And it doesn't mean raising hands or coming to the front or any of that. It it requires immediate action. Today's a reminder, Lord, for all of us that Sundays is not enough. Weekly is important. Gathering together weekly is important, but it is not enough. God, forgive us for every believer in here that has been ignoring you or cutting corners. And God, if if we are not mentally invested when we spend time with you, God, I pray that you, I pray that that conviction may be heavy and forgive us, Lord. Thank you that you don't hold that against us, that you will, that you will bury that in the tomb. And God, that from here on out, I pray that this week may be one of our best, for many of us, one of our best weeks spiritually, because we are going to be present and invested and showing up, believing God that you will show off. God, I know it in Jesus' name. God, and I pray also for the work of the enemy that is going to try to right now get each and every one of us to ignore that. Ah, don't worry, don't do 30 minutes. 10 is enough. For every every voice that we will, will hit, every believer in this place, for cutting corners and not trying, we speak against that right now. And God, I pray that you may, Holy Spirit, remind us of your truth. And God, regardless of others or do or not, may we do because of what you have done. And may we God, be different for it. And if you've never put your trust and faith and confidence in Christ, I want you to do two things. Number one, do it right now. And number two, you connect with me later because this is more than just a one moment experience. No, this is a starting line. And for those of us, if you've stopped running, get up, get up and keep chasing after God. He's waiting to see who's going to respond. God, I pray that we may all respond. And God, to you, like I said, like we just said again, we've said it twice. We declare one more time, may the Lord God continue to bless you and open up your eyes and move you to more than just superficial Christianity. May he move you into drawing closer to him. And may the more you do, may the more you do, the may you be strengthened and kept in his word. And like Jude says, now to him we bless the Lord God. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling into deception. May he and the one who is able to make you stand in his presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and together. And if you believe it and if you want to chase after God, say amen with me today.